welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Let's talk about Vice Dark Side of the Ring on The Sandman, which aired April 30th, 2024. A decent episode of Dark Side of the Ring. I don't think it was great, but it was good. Um, we're going to talk about Sandman today. So we're going to go into it a little bit. Um, the book Tide is God talked about Sandman quite a bit. There were some... Uh, Bits and pieces of things that I think was very interesting. But first, let's talk about the documentary. I thought it was pretty good. It had his family in it. Uh, Tyler Fullington was a part of the angle with Raven, which I consider one of the best storylines in wrestling. It was amazing. If you go back and watch ECW all the way through, the Sandman Raven stuff is really going to stick with you. Um and I'm glad they highlighted it and got, you know, Tyler to talk about it. Even though he was a little kid, I'm pretty sure he remembered some of it. Uh, Paul Lyon and saying that Macaulay Culkin was going to be involved with this thing. Which, you know, Macaulay Culkin could have bought ECW <laughs> for the price it would have paid to get him on the show. It's just such an obvious Paul Heyman lie, right? But um, Miss Peaches, who was the wife of Sandman, she got into the business around the same time he did. Uh, shortly after, maybe. But um, it was a very, very interesting story. A hell of a story. She was his manager for most of the run. Then she disappeared for a little while. And when she returned, she came back as uh, Raven's slave, I guess you could say. Um, but the boy, of course, stole the show. He was tremendous. I'm glad Raven was in there to give Tyler Fullington his, his props. The original Dominic Mysterio. You know, Dominic Mysterio looked very awkward and cringy. But Tyler Fullington, he looked like he was locked in whenever he was on screen. I mean, they say never do uh, television with kids and dogs because they will outshine you every time. And Tyler absolutely stole the show in that storyline. It was great. He talked about the crucifixion. Um, we're going to talk about the crucifixion a little bit more Um but it's essentially the same version of the story that you would get from the WWE ECW uh, documentary that um, Raven, who was Jewish, came up with the idea. And Stevie, uh, who is a Christian, was kind of like, no, this sucks. Don't do this. But um, Sandman didn't really care. And they did it, the crucifixion. And, you know, Kurt Angle was there. Kurt Angle was offended. Kurt Angle was pissed. He, he went home. Um, this was after Vince McMahon had tried to talk Kurt Angle into joining WWE. And then a couple of ventures of Kurt Angle's fell through. And he wanted to get into pro wrestling, but Vince wasn't answering his phone calls anymore. And so he was like, okay, well, I guess I'll give Paul a try. And he goes to an ECW show, and this is what he sees. <laughs> you know, and um, Raven ended up having to apologize for it. But... Um, it was it was a crazy angle, you know. It was an amazing angle too, by the way. Sacrilegious as it was, it was an amazing angle. So I really liked the documentary. Um, there's not a lot about Sandman's early life um, out there anywhere um, outside of maybe some shooter interviews. And I don't, you know, uh, sit down and listen to a lot of shooter interviews. But um, him talking about being a stripper before he was a wrestler, I mean, it's almost unbelievable. I almost don't believe it at all. At the same time, I kind of do believe it, you know. Um, but uh, him being a stripper was very weird. But, you know, that was that was funny. <laughs> um, the discussion about his early gimmick, there was no talk about how he got that gimmick. Um, I don't know how he got that gimmick either. I don't know where it came from. Uh, now, to kind of ease towards the wrestling part, uh, Joel Goodhart who they mentioned had a wrestling school in Dark Side of the Ring. He was actually the promoter uh, of what was called Tri-State Wrestling at the time. It was Pennsylvania, New York, and it was another state. Um, I don't remember. But uh, New Jersey. And um, he was the early promoter. He was a money mark, like many money marks. He spent more than he made. And he ended up taking a bunch of money and running. And when he did that... Uh, he had built up a bit of a reputation and they wanted his promotion to keep going. I'm going to correct myself. It was Pennsylvania, Delaware, and New Jersey. Um, I just flipped through the book and was like, that didn't sound right because it wasn't New York. It was Jersey and Delaware. 
And when he took the money and ran and pretty much screwed all the boys and didn't pay them, he didn't do a lot of shows, but he ran long enough to get um, a reputation. And he was known for bringing in like Abdullah the Butcher and Terry Funk and all these kinds of guys. It was a money market. Like, you know, these were the people that I was a fan of when I was a kid. I'm going to bring them in. And he would do that. And he would lose money on every show. So um, later in his tenure, he brought in Todd Gordon, who ended up, who Todd Gordon, his dad, owned a jewelry store called Carver Reed. And Carver Reed ended up being the financier for Joel Goodhart. And which means he was helping him secure buildings, helping him uh, pay talent and those sorts of things. So once Joel Goodhart took the money and ran, everybody who was working for Joel Goodhart went to Todd Gordon and said, hey, we want to keep running shows. Why don't you promote the shows? So this is, of course, of course, what created Eastern Championship Wrestling. And this is where Todd Gordon met the Sandman for the first time when he started promoting shows with Joel Goodhart. The Sandman was a fixture in Ty Gordon's ECW because the Sandman is essentially Ty Gordon's best friend. So he talks about him extensively in the book. There's a lot of stories about Sandman in the Todd is God book that he wrote with Sean Oliver. So that's where I'm going to get a lot of my information. But there was also, of course, plenty of interviews um, that he had done with other people. Specifically, I like to focus on websites that have... Uh, archives, so like Slam Wrestling and PW Insider, etc., because they keep like long histories of uh, of stuff, and I don't have to sit through hours and hours of shoot interviews full of what's probably garbage in order to get something <laughs> fairly interesting. But um, Sam was a centerpiece of East, of the early ECW that remained until Paul came in. Um, for a lot of people, they don't really know this because they're kind of outside. Maybe they were kids, but there was a schism between the Pennsylvania crew, what they call the Philly crew, and the New York crew. And that will become an, uh, an important piece later. That's why I mention it now. Because when Sandman left ECW, he left because the New York crew essentially took over. And so in 1999, early 1999, or maybe mid-1999, um, Sandman leaves ECW. Now, they didn't mention why he left ECW in Dark Side of the Ring, but it is discussed. And it's not really discussed that much, but it is discussed in Ty Gordon's book, why he left ECW. Now, the story needs to be told um, in full context. So Paul Heyman comes in. He becomes essentially the creative element behind ECW, but Ty Gordon was still the financier. Uh, Paul ended up buying into the company over time as Ty Gordon wanted to focus more on his actual paying job, which was running Carver Reed. Um, over time, ECW became more fun, but it, he was losing money. And so he would sell pieces of it to Paul until eventually Paul owned the whole damn thing. So now the New York crew owns ECW and Paul Heyman is the boss. And there were certain people, namely Sandman, who did not like that. As Ty Gordon is basically just a figurehead in ECW, uh, Paul's ideas are starting to rub people the wrong way. One of the ideas that was rubbing people the wrong way was Paul co-promoting with Vince McMahon. Uh, Ty Gordon didn't like it. A lot of the boys didn't like it. It was a thing that was becoming a problem. Um, in the book, uh, Ty Gordon and Paul saying that we should be fighting WWE, not joining it. Um, it was one of those kinds of things. But at this point, Paul owns the company. He's the boss, you know, and Ty Gordon is just kind of like, hey, whatever Paul wants to do, that's what Paul wants to do. But the boys are complaining. And since basically half the roster are handpicked Ty Gordon guys, it's becoming a bit of an issue. So people start coming to Ty Gordon trying to get out of ECW. And this is where we get the infamous mole issue where there was somebody that was helping ECW talent get jobs in WCW and WWE. And it was Ty Gordon. Now Ty Gordon swears up and down that he was not a mole and that he wasn't doing this to help WCW or WWE, that he was doing this to help his friends that a lot of these guys like the public enemy have busted their ass for him. And he had connections 
to get them better jobs, why wouldn't he help them? Why wouldn't he help his friends? Now, his connections in WCW was not exactly Eric Bischoff. His connection in WCW was through the taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan. Because Kevin Sullivan actually worked for Todd Gordon a couple of years before under Eastern Championship Wrestling, and they had kept in touch. So now Kevin Sullivan is suggesting talent to Eric Bischoff and those talents that are being suggested are being suggested at the behest of Todd Gordon. So Sandman gets out of ECW into WCW because Todd Gordon put a good word in. And that's pretty much it. Now, it becomes an even bigger deal a little bit later because Sandman left without giving notice. This is also something that was not discussed in Dark Side of the Ring. Um, not giving notice means he didn't say anything. He just vanished. Um, there's plenty of articles at the time, one of whom was by Slam Wrestling, that discusses uh, his return to ECW, which was actually a couple of months later. And uh, there was some issues about Sandman's return because Paul had told the audience and said it publicly that he would never work with the Sandman again. He would never bring him back. And then as soon as he got fired by WCW, he brought him back. <laughs> so, again, infamous truth teller, Paul Heyman. But um, it was all about business, of course. Uh, Sandman was great for business, but he was utilized mostly after his return to put people over. Um, if you ever watched the ECW program after Sandman returned, he basically just did jobs for Rhino. Like, he did like 100 jobs for Rhino. I mean, his wife got piled drive through a table, and he still lost to Rhino. I mean, he lost to Rhino like 100 times. He was literally the brick and mortar of making Rhino in the later years of ECW. And um, it should tell you that's why the company went out of business. They brought the Sandman back, and then they buried him. You know, because he had left the first time without giving notice. Of course, this wasn't the first time this had happened to somebody. Sabu had did something similar to Paul a couple of years before that. So it was it wasn't like it was something that was uh, completely not without precedent. So to get into the mole thing a little bit, even though I already told the, the bulk of it, this is how it is told in the Todd is God book. In late 1995, Teddy and Johnny, this will be the public enemy, came to me and said they wanted to go to WWE. I thought they would get over anywhere they went, but I suspected they'd be treated better in WCW. And I could use my relationship with Kevin Sullivan to get them a better deal. Kevin was booking for WCW, and he was fond of using our people. I called him and said Vince had made Public Enemy an offer, but I thought they were better suited there. Sullivan said he'd check with WCW's executive vice president, Eric Bischoff, and get back to me. That offer was WWE was a good thing. Once Eric heard that, he told Sullivan to double the amount for WCW. It was a super offer. I didn't want them to leave, but I loved those guys and wanted them to do as well as possible. They took the offer and worked in WCW for a couple of years before going to WWE and getting squashed by the tag team APA when Teddy and Johnny didn't want to lose by going through a table, which was their gimmick. Though I was happy to see our guys move on to make real money, Paul was not. He was leaving ECW. At, he saw leaving ECW as the ultimate act of betrayal. These workers took such risks and during inhumane punishment for ECW, and they were paid a few hundred bucks for it. When they were finally offered a hundred thousand dollar guarantee with upside potential, how could you not be happy for them? Their investment in us finally paid off for them. Whenever someone came to me about leaving, I told them to go. But to Paul, if you left, you were dead to him. Sandman and Fonzie came up to me in 1997 and said they were miserable without me at the helm and they had, had enough. They hated Paul and needed to get out of there and asked me to call WCW. In doing so, they started a shitstorm I'm still asked about today. And that was, of course, the mole situation. This would have been a great episode to talk about the mole story. Even though I know it kind of would have taken off the, the Sandman a little bit. But a lot of people have heard the mole story because it is a WWE story. So Paul Heyman has told the story a hundred times that, you know, there was somebody and he would never say it was Ty Gordon, even though everybody knows it was Todd Gordon by now that was helping ECW talent leave. But when you read it from Ty Gordon's perspective, it was actually a good thing because he saw like these guys are tearing their bodies up and they're not making any money. Let's help them 
you know, go somewhere else. Like, yeah, you're kind of helping WCW and ECW incidentally, but you're really helping your friends. But Paul didn't see it that way, clearly, as I just described. Uh, Sandman and WCW didn't get a lot of time in uh, Dark Side of the Ring. They discussed him getting on steroids and becoming abusive and beating the shit out of his wife and, and all this kind of crazy stuff, which led to him getting divorced which was frightening. Um, I tried to look up uh, him on steroids. I didn't see a lot of anything. I don't remember him looking bigger than ever. He might have been large, but I don't think he was like big and muscular. It's not like he turned into like, you know, the ultimate warrior overnight or anything like that. Cause he still was just kind of like a jacked drunk. <laughs> you know, like That was pretty much it. But that could be achieved just by simply gaining weight. But, uh, that was an interesting story. He did, absolutely did nothing in WCW. It was a complete waste of time. And it was a complete waste of everybody's time and energy. And uh, if you ever saw Sandman in WCW, it was absolutely embarrassing. But uh, I'm not surprised that he didn't get a lot of time. Of course, the episode mostly talked about drugs. He was doing drugs before he even got into wrestling. And uh, was one of those guys that did so much drugs that people are surprised he's still alive. But um, I am glad that he's still alive to tell his story. Um, and it was an interesting story to tell. But of course, there were some things in it that probably could have been made the story a little bit better. Um, Ty Gordon in his book talked about Sandman quite a bit. And one of the things that he talked about that I thought was a really great ECW angle that wasn't discussed as much is the Sandman being blinded. That's something that, <laughs> you know... Uh, it was kind of a rip a little bit on the junkyard dog being blinded in New Orleans. Um, but it was a similar thing where Sandman gets caned in the face by Tommy Dreamer and loses his eyesight. It also involved a lit cigarette. I believe Tommy Dreamer maybe jabbed him in the eye with a cigarette and caned him in the other eye. It was something that was pretty, pretty wild. But Todd Gordon really loves this angle because it was, it was cooked up by him and Sandman. And, um, he discusses it and how much he really enjoyed the angle in the book. Of course, they mentioned his time in WWF, um, you know, when, after the ECW revival. Um, this time was a little weird. Um, it was good because it was something that Sandman grew up watching. He grew up a WWF fan as a kid. You know, he was really, that's what got him into wrestling. That's what made him aware of wrestling was watching the New York Territory because they often came to Pennsylvania. And now he got to work there under the ECW banner, but it was a little bit more sanitized than the regular everyday ECW product. And a lot of people asked the question, why? Why was this more sanitized? As well, because they had uh, it's a different ECW was losing money because it was an adult product, a niche product for a niche audience. That's what it was. Uh, WWE was running a mainstream product and they wanted it, it to be an offshoot of their mainstream products, but it, of course it couldn't be. Now, something that of course was not discussed in the documentary that probably is insignificant, but it's interesting, so I'll bring it up here, is that Sandman was actually sued by a woman named Carlene Boutwell in 2007 because she claimed that Sandman picked her up and threw her while bleeding on her during the August 8th, 2006 episode of ECW on sci-fi. This of course is ridiculous. Like if you saw his entrance, clearly he did not pick up a woman and throw her, but he was swinging beer all over the place. He was headbutting himself and maybe blood got on her. And uh, she was seeking $100,000 in damages. She sued both Sandman and WWE. Um, I looked to see what, what happened to this case. I assumed it was dismissed, and it was, but there was some kind of settlement. She, she probably got the $100,000 she was looking for or whatever, and uh, that was pretty much it. But Sandman's run in WWE didn't last very long. He got to wrestle at WrestleMania, which was interesting because... It wasn't until we watched, uh, I watched WrestleMania that I remember that he even appeared there. No big deal is made about the Sandman wrestling at WrestleMania at all. Uh, he made about $40,000 that night. He said the match was a $320,000 match. So I'm going to assume that's eight divided 
you know, three hundred and twenty thousand dollars divided by eight. And they're about everybody made about forty thousand dollars, give or take. That's pretty good for a guy who used to wrestle in bingo halls. You know, a guy who once got banned from the venue in Pennsylvania for spitting on a waitress. You know, for the guy to still be in good enough physical condition to make it to WrestleMania 23, get on the card, didn't do a damn thing on the card, didn't do a damn thing at the show, probably didn't do a damn thing that entire run, but lose and still made out like a goddamn bandit. He did. He didn't do too bad. But uh, it wasn't a bad episode of Dark Side of the Ring. It wasn't a lot, but um, it was simply guy you know drank and did drugs, drank and did drugs a lot, beat up his wife, and blew away his whole career. But hey, wasn't he cool marching through the crowd, bleeding and pouring beer on everybody? And man, wasn't that cool. It was a very cool visual. The Sandman's entrance was always amazing. Uh, Sandman angle is usually pretty good too. Um, the the angle with Raven, I'll just never forget that. The blinding, the angle with uh, Tommy Dreamer, that, all that stuff was very good. Um, but he had his run. It was about 94 to like 97, 98 in uh, ECW and nothing after that. Uh, nothing you ever see of the Sandman after 1998 is worth watching, if we've been honest. But what a what a talented guy at nothing. You know, <laughs> highly talented at nothing. Uh, what do you guys think? Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out. Bongo Slay. Best house ever, you daddy. <laughs>